So there's my details. Um, genuine offer. If anybody ever has questions, you're more than welcome to contact me. Um, so drafting and interpreting financial statements. So um, I have spent quite a bit of time um, looking through the, 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 the chief examiner report to make sure that Really, what I was telling you today was hopefully relevant for you. So the Chief Examiner Report was um, produced, um, I believe, let me just double check. Um, it was produced and it was produced in during the year. And the pass rate for this exam, 74% of students um, are passing this assessment. And that was to the year ending June 2023. So seven tasks in this assessment at level four. Um, a variety of things that you're going to be expected to do on the day. So you've got your first two tasks, which probably your comforting ones, production of single company accounts. So when we're talking about producing single company accounts, we're talking about things like producing your profit and loss, your statement of financial position, those kind of things. Task three, task four. Task three, we're talking about the International Accounting Standards Board's conceptual framework. And task four, those accounting standards. Then we're back to probably where we like to be, consolidated financial statements, where we're pulling together our numbers again in the groups of companies this time. Then we're going to calculate some ratios in task six. And in seven, we've got to talk about those ratios as well. So which are the strongest tasks? Which one of the ones we do well in? It probably won't be any surprise to you to know that the one thing that all of these tasks have in common is that they are all number based. So task one and two, as I said, profit and loss, statement of financial position, your cash flow statements as well, or your statement of changes in equity. So those two tasks are often done very well. Task five, where we're producing a group of companies' accounts. So we're taking our individual company accounts and bringing them together to make them into a group of company accounts so that we can see what the position is for the group across the period. And then task six, calculating the ratios. So these are the ones we do well in. That's not, there's no point in me going over these today. What we want to do is concentrate and help, hopefully give you some tips of how to perform and bring up those lower performing tasks. So today I'm mainly going to concentrate on the first two, task three and task four, because I think task seven probably needs a whole webinar by itself, if I'm honest. Now, task three, the IASB conceptual framework. Now, IASB stands for International Accounting Standards Board. So they have a framework. Why do we have it? Well, the purpose of it is to help the IASB to develop and revise accounting standards. It helps organisations to develop those consistent accounting policies when we're producing our financial statements. So task three is all about demonstrating your understanding of that. Now, task four could be very varied. Um, and again, that, that always puts us a bit on edge because it's quite a big topic to cover the international accounting standards. And I'm sure those of you who are revising or are working through this unit at the moment, you'll be thinking, Caroline, that's a lot of standards. You're right. There is quite a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll hopefully go over a few of those today, just give you an idea of what kind of things might be expected. Obviously, this is our opinion. Interpretation of ratios. Testing if you understand how and why the ratios will differ from one year to the next. Now, I want to stress about your exam approach. Um, according to the chief examiner's report, students take on average 74% of the time that's available, which means that there is some time to spare if that's the average that's taken. So my first thing that I always stress to our students is never, ever leave an exam with a question unanswered. Even if you're a complete blank, guess, put something down because you just never know. There might be something, even on a written task in your subconscious, that's telling you that it's that answer. Just put it down. It can't harm if you really don't think you know it. The other tip I would always give, and, and I'd say this at all levels, you don't have to do your exam in order. You don't have to start at task one and finish at task seven. Maybe you consider, and certainly this is something I was doing when I studied, I did my strongest tasks first. So, for example, in this one, I would probably say, oh, I'm definitely going to do number one and two first. And then I'd probably jump to number six and then maybe number five after that. 
But I would go for the ones that I know I'm strongest at because you're probably a bit quicker at those. So once you've got all of those done and you feel confident with them, then you maybe freed yourself up some time to have a go at those other tasks as well. Another tip, when you actually open your exam, don't just, as I said, start a task one and work your way through. Consider reading all of the tasks, see what's coming up. And the reason I'd suggest doing this, and this, this has happened to me whilst I, when I used to, when I was sitting exams, is that if you have a read through what's coming in your assessment, as you attempt tasks, it might trigger something and you can make a note of it on the rough paper. And when you get to that task, you've got somewhere to start with it. So maybe have a read through. Something will possibly pop into your head then while you're doing the other tasks. So just a few things to consider. So let's have a look at these um, tasks where maybe we can try and improve our performance a little bit. So the conceptual frameworks. What's key to this? There are some definitions. We need to learn them. So things like your asset, liability, equity, income expenses. That's not an exhaustive list, may I just caveat that. Um, there are others that will come under the conceptual framework. For example, you know, describing things like going concern, that kind of thing. So just be aware, make sure you have them, because if you can learn those definitions and you can reel those off in the exam, that is going to help you gain some of those all important marks. What else could happen in this one? You could be asked about the structure of businesses. So things like, can you describe a PLC, a private limited company? Those kind of things could also come up in this assessment. These are the kind of tips that I've taken from the chief examiner's uh, report to just give you areas that they've discussed could come up. Um, and the role of directors, you know, directors are there to run the organisation. So when they're in their role, do they make decisions that benefit the company? Well, they should. The decision making should be company focused, not themselves. They should follow company rules in those articles of association. But they've also got to make sure that company accounts present a true and fair view of the organisation's finances. So how would we approach this kind of question? Well, task three, 27% of students achieved competency in this um, task based on the chief examiner report that's available on the AAT Lifelong Learning Portal as well for you to have a good read through. So let's see if we can do something to try and help with that. So expectations. Couple of things, I said about the definitions a minute ago. If you can reel off a definition in your exam, you've got something to help structure your answer. So I would certainly use that definition. Then you need to link it to the scenario. So how, do you, how are you gonna link it to the scenario? Look for some key points. Something in the scenario will be giving you a tip of what to include in your answer. Now there's eight marks available in this task. So when you've got the part, so maybe it'll have part A, B, C, for example, pay attention to how many marks are available in each of those parts of the, of the task to make sure that you put enough points down. If there's four marks, make four points. Don't leave it with two and hope that you've done enough to gain more. But what I would say, and this is something I've experienced when I've been marking our students' work, um, is don't brain dump. Don't tell me everything you know about that topic unless it's relevant. So if you reel me off everything that goes into that accounting standard, I've got to work my way through and pick out what's relevant to this task. So make sure you, you only include relevant points. So the idea of what I thought I'd have a look at today is sort of give you an idea of a couple of suggested ways we can approach some, some tasks that we've come up with at peak. So I had suggested about reporting framework. So might come up, the conceptual framework for financial reporting identifies going concern as an underlying assumption. Explain the going concern assumption. So there's two marks available for this kind of tasks. Now, if we are talking about going concern, we're talking about the fact that it's going to keep going. That's one of the things I always say link it to the fact that it's going to continue. Now, if it's going to continue, we want it to continue making sales. That's part of the answer that we are looking for when we're talking about that kind of assumption. Now, 
I've given you the full answer here. The assumption of going concern is that a company will continue in operational existence. What do I mean by operational existence? That it will continue to trade. So will, in other words, when we produce our financial statements, we are assuming that that company will still be there in 12 months time, still doing what it does now, still selling those products or providing those services that it is now. How long for the foreseeable future? How long is the foreseeable future? It, it, piece of string type idea here. Generally, we're talking about at least the next 12 months. So when we are producing financial statements, we're saying we think they'll continue to trade for the foreseeable future. And we're not expecting anything different to happen to the organisation. Now, if the directors feel that actually the organisation isn't doing what we planned and we're going to have to wind down maybe all or part of the business, then we've got to be very careful. And if we are going to wind down the business, then we need to state it. So what we do when we're talking about going concern, we're saying we're going to continue to trade and we don't have the intention nor the need to liquidate or curtail materially the scale of its operations. And basically what we're saying is we're not going to stop trading. That's the plan. We're going to carry on. We don't expect, I'm sure you've come across materiality, we don't expect anything material, anything that's big enough to affect our accounts. If we do, then you've got to use a different basis of reporting in your financial statements. So going concern, we're going to continue to trade for the foreseeable future and we've got no plans to reduce, curtail, no plans to liquidate or change our operations materially, okay? So that's the kind of answer we'd probably be looking at for part A. Now, part B, explain why trade payables are treated as a liability based on the IFRS conceptual framework. Now, again, this, this is brilliant if you know the definition of a liability, because there is undoubtedly some of those four marks that you will gain from that definition. So IFRS, stands for International Financial Reporting Standard. Now, a definition of a liability, a present obligation of the entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of a past event. Great, how does that help me, Caroline? Let's think about how we can link that. So, trade payables. Now, remember, in your question, one of the things I often say to students is, Make a point, explain it, and apply it. So P, point, explain, apply. So trade payables is, it, get that into your answer. So don't just write out the definition of a liability. Make sure you link it to a trade payable. So trade payables reflect an amount owing to suppliers for goods bought on credit terms. Essentially, the first thing, as I'm, first thing I'm doing here is I'm saying, this is what a trade payable is. I know what they are. We owe our suppliers some money because we bought something on credit from them. So how does this link to the conceptual framework? Well, I need to explain why trade payables fit the definition of a liability. And that's what we're doing down here. How does it fit the definition of a liability? So the amount owing is the present obligation. So we know how much we owe because we'll have an invoice from the supplier. The supplier will have sent us that invoice to tell us this is what you owe us. We bought something in the past. We bought it before year end. There's our past event. The purchase is the past event. So how will it result in an tra economic transfer? Well, we're going to have to pay the supplier when the amount becomes due. So the economic transfer will be in the form of cash when we pay that supplier. Now, one of the things I often hear students say to me is, well, I I'd never write that. Put it into your words is absolutely fine, but if you can incorporate the definition in it, 
and link it, it's it's going to definitely help you to gain more marks in that area on task three. Now, task three contains those uh, some written tasks, but it can also contain short answer tasks as well. So it could contain like true, false or drag, drop, fill gaps, those kind of things. So let's have a look at a couple of, of these that we've just created. So the two basic underlying assumptions for the preparation of financial statements are the accruals concept and understandability. Now, part of me looks at that and goes, yeah, and I think they're right. Accruals, yes, but not understandability. Understandability is what we call one of our enhancing qualitative characteristics. Now, what's one of those? That our enhancing qualitative characteristics are there to help ensure, and if we produce our financial information and we make sure that it displays those enhancing qualitative characteristics, we're helping to make that financial information more useful to others. So that one, would be false. Now, let's have a look at the second part. The objective of financial reporting is to provide financial information about the reporting entity that's useful to existing and potential investors, lenders and other creditors in making decisions relating to providing resources to the entity. Absolutely true, it definitely is. We provide financial information. Remember, there's quite a lot of groups of users that will be looking at our financial statements. So potential investors. So if you're deciding whether to spend some money on buying shares in a company, which company will you look at? Will you prepare? You'll look at the financial statements and make a decision. Of course, lenders, the banks or the financial institutions, they'll be looking at what we what your financial statements say as to whether they should lend you some cash. Can you pay it? Can you pay them back? When can you pay them back? How long do you take to pay them back? So absolutely true for that second part. So task three, yes, it's got writing in it. And yes, I know that means that we're not always keen on it, but it does mean that if you can use those definitions, they can really help you to structure an answer. So you could, it's my, my approach when I was a student, um, I used to get my little, I used to have little spiral bound, like little revision cards that I think a lot of the publishers do produce. Um, and I used to use them and try and learn a definition, especially in the run up to the exam, sort of a month out or so. I'd make sure that I could learn those definitions. So, and if, if I was really feeling sad, I used to, you know, lie in bed at night reading and that was the excitement of my social life in the run up to my revision. It's worth a shout. See how it works for you. That's just how it worked for me. It was quiet. I could do it then. Now, oh, task four. On. Sorry. Hi, sorry. Super quick before you go through task four. Just wanted to get a question through to you and then maybe yeah. pause to see if anyone had any questions about task three. Super quickly. Um, so, Ally did ask, so she was mentioning um, when you said about looking through, the, looking through all the questions. But yes. she said... Um, you know, you said to look through all the questions, but when doing the exam, you have to go through each question in order before being able to go back. Is there an easy way to go through the questions? I could be wrong on my knowledge of the accounting of the exam software here, but I think on the right hand side, there is um, an option that you can select that will give you an option to jump between them. I can't remember for the life of me what it's called right now because I was talking about it in class yesterday to my students. So I think on the right hand side of the screen, it's there and it, and it gives you an option to then go between the different tasks. Okay, perfect. And super quick. Uh, yeah. So we just did task three. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have any questions. If you've got any questions about task three at all, um, do let us know and then we can cover that. Uh, I'm just going to wait for a couple of seconds and then see if anything comes through if not then we can proceed but i will take note of anything that does come through and then we can pause you know and, and answer them at at a later date um Allied says it has changed recently but she will check okay no problem um yeah no worries so what i'll say is let's go through it if any questions do come through i'll let you know and we can take it from there thanks Jaden. No worries.
So task four then, accounting standards. There's, a, there's quite a few. Um, there's no easy way for me to say that. There's quite a few. And how are you going to succeed in this task? You've got to be able to explain each standard. There's no easy way around this one. It is it is quite hard graph. Some of them are nicer than others, aren't they? Let's be honest. We, we talk about inventory right back at level three. So that's a nicer one if we need to talk about that. And depreciation. And I think even revaluing property uh, plans and equipment, I think we'd all be happier with those. But there's some trickier ones, isn't there? Things like leases um, or um, um, events after the reporting period. So some of them are a bit more tricky than others. When you're going through them, my tip with this is the ones that you think are more tricky, spend more time on them because you will. It's probably one of those guarantees, isn't it? The ones that you don't like are the ones that will come up. So if you if you get to a top and you think, oh, I don't know this, you need you need to go over it. Make sure because 70 percent it's a high pass mark on AAT. So you work hard to get them. So make sure you go into it with as much knowledge as you possibly can. So you must be able to talk about the accounting standards that are covered. So one of the key areas that are noticed in the chief examiner report as well is ma making sure that not only can you talk about them, but can you apply the figures to the financial statements as well? So if you are, for example, having to do an adjustment, can you tell the examiner in the question, in, the, in your answer, how to do that adjustment? How does it affect the profit and loss? How does it affect your statement of financial position? So we're talking about knowing the theory behind the accounting standard, being able to explain it. So what else has come up in this chief examiner report? You're probably not surprised to know that this is a written task again. Um, I think that's one thing that the um, lower performing tasks have in common. They're all written tasks and students have forever said to me, we hate written tasks, Caroline. I know <laughs> I did too when I was a student, but the one thing I would strongly say is that um, the way accounting software is going, um, the way technology is changing, talk about things like AI, we talk about um, systems being able to now scan things in and do a lot of the populating of the accounting software for us. We've got to be able to understand what it is we're doing behind the scenes. It's not just a matter of knowing that that number goes in that box anymore. It's a matter of being able to explain it to other people. And that's what we're testing in these kind of tasks. So when we're doing the task for the accounting standard, make sure, for example, you check your answer carefully. Make sure you've answered what it is that's been that's in the question. Don't dive into it because, I, I mean, I've done this many times. You read something, you think, oh, that's what they're asking. And you get your answer out and then you read it again and go, it wasn't what they were asking, Caroline. It was something else. So you need to pay attention to the question and check your answer carefully. Pay attention to dates. For example, if you're working out expenses, make sure that when when did they incur the expense? If it's an annual expense, is there any need for an accrual or prepayment adjustment at the end of the year? Those kind of things will just be dropped into the, into the text. You've got to make sure you're capable of, of, of applying them. So this task will have a combination. It's going to have written tasks. It's going to have some short to computer marked one so again things like true false drag drop and again i'm back to that p point explain apply so again we've just produced an idea of what what might come up so a key customer went into liquidation on the 20th of feb 20x2 the directors believe that none of the 890,000 receivable is going to be recoverable so explain how this event should be accounted for within the financial statements for the year ended 31st of December X1, where appropriate, refer to the relevant accounting standard. So what, which accounting standard are we talking about here? This is events after the reporting period. Because... This happened on the 20th of Feb, and we're talking about the financial statements at the year end of the 31st of December X1. So before I pull my answer together on the next slide, what is events after the reporting period? I don't think it could harm to just have a little chat about what it is. So we're talking about an event that occurs after the end of the reporting period, so after year end, 
but before the financial statements are authorized for issue. So, so why does this happen? So let's say I've got a year end in this example, let's stick with what's here, 31st of the 12th X1. So I've got a year end sat there. Now, the ideal and probably similar timelines, about three months later, maybe four, dependent on the size of the organization, so let's go for the 31st of the third X2. At that point, your financial statements will be authorized for issue. In other words, we're happy for them to be published at that point. So your shareholders will get them. They'll have a look through them. The shareholders are then deciding whether or not the directors have been running the company well on their behalf that year. And it's this period here that we're talking about with events after the reporting period. Something is happening between the end of December and the end of March that affects what those numbers that are in your accounts at the year end. And what else happens during that time? Well, auditors will visit, potentially gathering information. They're aiming to compile their audit report and they will produce that. If they're then happy with statements, then they'll be authorised for issue to the shareholders. So during that period, in this instance, this is just a hypothetical timeline, in that three month period, things can happen that affect those numbers at year end. And in this instance, what's happened? Well, one of the suppliers, sorry, one of our customers has gone into liquidation. 890,000 is, it, we don't believe we're going to get it in. It's an irrecoverable debt. So it's highly likely that we're not going to get any money for that. Now, what we have to determine with events after the reporting period is we have to make a decision. And the decision we have to make is, do we adjust for the, account, the accounts or is it a non-adjusting event? That's what we're looking for, an adjusting or a non-adjusting event. How do we determine? Generally, we look for evidence of it in the financial statements at year end. If there is evidence that it was there at year end, then we need to adjust it because by leaving it in, in this example, we would be saying that we've got an asset of 890,000 that the customer owes us. But actually, by the 20th of February, before the statements were agreed and authorised, well, that, that debt is not going to come in and we're aware of that. So what we have to do is we have to adjust the accounts at year end and we have to change them to say, no, we should be writing that off. It shouldn't be there in the accounts. Non-adjusting events, to give you a quick example of those before I sort of structure the answer for this, a non-adjusting event would be something like a fire or flood that happens after year end. You weren't aware of it at year end, but potentially it's, an, it's something that then happens after year end. If it's material, we'd pop it in as a note to the accounts. So how would you write your answer? I would put something along these lines. So this was for three marks. My answer would say, because I want to make sure they, they know I understand. So this is IAS 10, events after the reporting period. And as far as I'm concerned, this is an adjusting event. as it provides evidence of conditions that existed at the 31st of the 12th X1. What was the evidence? What were the conditions that existed? We had a receivable in our accounts. So what do we need to do? So I've explained it. I've linked it to the accounting standard. I've explained what I think I need to do, as in, yes, it's an adjusting event. What do we need to do? We need to adjust the statements for a bad debt. We need to write it off. 
for 890,000. And what we're gonna do, we would write it off in our receivables and we would have a corresponding expense in your statements of profit or loss, which I'm just gonna abbreviate. So statements of profit or loss. So we need to adjust for that in the statements of financial position. We don't wanna show that we've got that asset and we've got a corresponding expense in the statements of profit and loss. So three marks. So I think we probably gain all of them there. Let's have a look at something else, another little accounting standard we dropped in. And I mentioned before, we're not overly keen on leases. So leases have got, an, you know, we, we've got our accounting standard that we need to follow. So we have different types of leases that we enter into as organizations. We have those leases that therefore produce what we call a right of use asset. In other words, a right of use asset is a long term lease generally um, that we're going to have in the organization for quite some time. But we've chosen rather than buy the asset outright, we've chosen to lease it on a longer term basis. So in a sense, it's still behaving like we own it. So we're recognizing that it's a right of use asset. Now, let's have a look at this example, because the other type of lease is what we call a short life, low value lease. What we've got to do is determine, do we think that in these examples, we've got a right of use asset, which are the longer term ones, or do we think we've got a short life, low value? So on the 1st of October 2006, we entered into a 12 month lease for production machinery. Under the terms of the lease, Molly Limited had to make a payment of 3,500 on the 1st of October X6. Another payment of three and a half will be made on the 31st of March X7, and it has a useful life of six years and would have cost 32,000 had it been purchased outright on the 1st of October X6. So, what is this? This is a short life, low value. I always get those mixed up. I often say short value, low life. That's not correct. Short life, low value lease. In other words, how do I know that? Because it's 12 months or less. 12 months or less, short life, low value. That means it's, it's a lot easier to deal with in the statements. So what do we do instead? We have an expense in the accounts. So they've asked us, what would we recognize in the statement of profit or loss? Well, I need to work out what my expenses would be by year end. So year end is still 31st December, but this year at time it's X6. And you've got to pay attention. This is one of those areas I said before, pay attention to the dates. We made a payment of three and a half on the 1st of October. That's when we entered into the lease. Therefore, by year end, we had had the lease for, what was it, three months. So three months by year end. Let me make that look a little bit more like the word months. Probably not much more, but there we go. Three months by year end. So I only want to recognize three months of the expense in my accounts. So how much is the total expense that we're going to recognize across the year? Well, it's two payments of that three and a half. So my total cost is 7,000, two payments of three and a half. but I only want three months worth. So I take my 7,000, divide it by 12, times it by three. How much are we going to recognize in the statement of profit and loss? We're going to recognize 1750 of expense at year end. Then you'll often find, there's my numbers. Now you've got to be able to explain it. So what, why do we only recognize that? Well, I've just popped the question here again, just to be able to refer to it. This accounting standard that we're interested in is well, IFRS 16. So International Financial Reporting Standard 16. And it enables us that because it's that 
short life, low value lease, we're allowed to do what we call a simplified treatment. And that is because the lease is less than, or sorry, I'm going to caveat that, because the lease is 12 months or less, I should say. The lease is for 12 months or less. So short term, let's expense it. So what do we do? We recognize the lease payments on a straight line basis. And that's exactly what we just did. So what we did is we said, right, well, what was the cost for 12 months? We've only got it for three months of the year by year end. So three months will be an expense by year end. So we had 12 months of payments but only three months of use by year end. There's my explanation. Link it to the scenario. We've linked it to that 12 month lease. We, we recognize the cost. We're telling them how to apply the accounting standard and we're explaining why it's only three months. So, a task four will be, as I said, some form of written accounting standard that you've got to be able to explain, apply the theory to the scenario you've been given, but also make sure that we can apply those numbers as well. And um, Jaden, I just wanted to say at this point, is there anything, any questions come up on task four before I move on to the last little part? Yeah, no, so been having a look. I think everyone's super locked in. <laughs> <laughs> Too much excitement um, of accounting standards, Jaden. What can I say? Very <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give it a few seconds just to say if there is anything about task four accounting standards that you guys needed to us to go over again or something you didn't understand, do let us know and we're happy to cover that. Um, but if not, we can proceed as planned. But yeah, just going to give it a few more seconds and then we will take it from there. And do, 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 do. no, I think I think everyone gets it. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. So I mentioned earlier that task seven was one of the other areas um, that the chief exam uh, chief examiner's report mentioned was one of the lower performing tasks. So I've just given an idea of how to approach it because obviously we're we're approaching forty five minutes now, and honestly, for me to show you how to exam uh, attempt a question, it'd probably take me another forty five minutes, and I'm sure you're ready for your lunch, quite honestly. So, interpretation of ratios. Now, how I would suggest students have have a go at this one. You've got to clearly explain the ratio results. Think about what the ratio shows you. So. For example, gross profit, that is calculating the profit that's generated from our sales. Explain that in your sort of first line of your, of your response about the interpretation. You've got to explain the movement in the ratios. So for example, let's say we've got one year to the second year, so X1 to X2. And let's say I've got gross profit percentage of 10% in year one, 23% in year two. Now, what's happened there? Now, if you say that gross profit percentage has increased, yes, you're explaining that there's a movement in numbers, but what you're not doing there is explaining that you understand the results of the ratio. Going from 10 to 23 means you've got more profits being generated from your sales. That is better for the organization. OK, so it's really important by using that descriptive, better or worse, you're clearly saying you understand the results of the ratio. And I can show you another reason why. Think about gearing. Now, gearing is a measure of risk, comparing the debt to the equity in your business. 
Now, if your gearing goes from 10% to 23%, that's worse. So that's why I say, because if you'd have said gearing has increased, again, you've not necessarily told the examiner that you understand the results of the ratio. So if you can stick with using words like better, worse, deteriorated, improved, try not to write it's gone up, it's gone down, it's increased, it's decreased. A descriptive can make all the difference. When you're then writing about the ratio to say, why, why has it happened? Well, think about what goes into the calculation of that ratio. For example, I'll stick with gross profit. It's gross profit divided by your sales times 100. So talk about how you calculate, look at, look, well, in the exam, in this scenario, there'll be something there as a tip. Sales have increased during the year and it will, you know, might give you different figures. But sales have increased. So if sales have increased, then maybe that's one of the influencing factors. So look for things and talk about what calculates the ratio. So I often say to students, because you, you'll get a section to write about each of the ratios, write the ratio out on your rough paper that you're talking about. And it might help you to focus your answer. And then, as I said, link it to the scenario. There'll be something, there'll be a tip in there somewhere that gives you a hint as to, oh, I can bring that in. Also, if you can, link your ratios to each other where it's possible. Yeah, for example, if you have got more finance costs, then you'd expect gearing to get worse because potentially you took out more debt. So things like that can link in the question, in the um, answers. So they're just some tips to help with task seven for your interpretation of ratios. And that sort of brings me to the end of everything I wanted to cover. I think we're at about 45 minutes in now. So Jaden, I don't know if any other questions have come up or if anyone's got anything they want to ask at this stage. Yeah, so we did have a couple of questions come through. <clears throat> Okay. So uh, Jessica Carter was asking, how come the useful life doesn't come into effect? And she was saying this was in relation to task four. Task four. The question one, yeah, the yeah. useful life of the machine. So the useful life doesn't come into effect, Jessica, because this is the short life, low value asset. If it was a longer term lease, then we would treat it like an asset and then we would have to calculate depreciation. So they've sort of given you that information as a bit of a, a curveball, if I'm honest. They're testing, do you understand that we don't need to depreciate short life, low value assets? Does that help at all? Hopefully it does. Yeah, that, that should be all good. If not, of course, she will let us know. Right. Um, Ally, what well, Ali? I, I believe it's Ali. I've been saying Ali this whole time, but sorry, apologies <laughs> for butchering your name. Um, has said, um, do you need to mention that this could be because of higher sales prices, lower costs from supplies, etc., and that's in relation to the ratios okay. for GP, etc. Yeah, um, definitely. If you can explain, so for example, if you're, I'm just writing it out. Let me write it out on the screen. So if let me get my little pen out. Here we go. So if your gross profit when X1, X2, we said 10 to 23, if it's getting better, I nearly said increase then, if it's getting better from one year to the next, yeah, if you can surmise reasons why it might happen, brilliant, go for it, explain for them. So for example, you could have increased your selling price and if you've increased your selling price, then you are going to generate more profit. So, yes, yeah, certainly, if you can surmise as to why it might happen, definitely include that in your answer. Okay, perfect. All righty. Many thanks. Oh, just got another one coming in from Andrew saying, quick query in relation to task four, matter one. What if the financial statements were prepared and submitted by the 31st of January, 2000 and Oof. whatever? Let me go um, back. That's the one. Yeah, it doesn't that one. specify. Yeah. That would be very quick. It's <laughs> my first answer. Um, for you to do all of your year-end adjustments 
and um, potentially have them authorised for issue within a month. If that has happened, you have to recognise the adjustment as soon as possible in your next set of accounts, because if they've already been authorised for issue, you, you can't change them necessarily at that point, but you would have to recognise the expense as soon as you possibly could afterwards. Hopefully that helps with Andrew's question. Okay, perfect. Um, Ali just mentioned, she said, just, do they not give this as a scenario in relation to her question about the ratios? Sorry, say that again, Jaden. So she was asking, do they not give this as a scenario? You know, you talked about the, um, you know, do you need to mention this because of higher sales prices, lower costs from suppliers? Um, um, they can do. The so, yeah, they might do. It just depends on the question that you've got. Sometimes they will give you lots of information um, and you'll be able to to then link it quite clearly to the scenario. Um, other times you might have to suggest reason why the, the ratio could change. So, for example, hearing, if that has got worse, it's the, the numbers have increased then you've potentially taken out more debt. So maybe they they might not always tell you, but sometimes they do. So yeah, if you can link it to scenario, that's fantastic. Perfect. Uh, Sally Ann Sykes has asked for task four, would we need to, would, sorry, would we need a prepayment for the other three months already paid too, not just a three months expense? So oh, the only reason I haven't talked about the prepayment adjustment is because in, in this, it just asked me for the statement of profit or loss. But yes, quite rightly, what you would need to do is also have a prepayment adjustment in the statement of financial position. And that would therefore record the fact that by year end, you'd paid three and a half thousand, but you'd only actually expensed one seven five oh. So, yes, you would have a prepayment adjustment as well in your statement of financial position. Amazing. So um, that seems to be all for now. Um, yeah, from what I can see, of course, something might come through very shortly. But Fine. before I start wrapping up, is there anything else that you wanted to cover? Anything you wanted to talk about in relation to uh, peak accountancy? Okay. or? Well, what Anything I wanted like to that? say, based on the questions that we've just got there, Jade, and that's some very well organised students. So, brilliant questions. And if you if you're asking these kind of questions, I think it's showing that you're putting your work in. So, that, that's very reassuring. So, good luck with your exams because I'm sure they must be upcoming at some point soon. Um, but no, I don't think we've got anything else, Jaden, at that stage. Unless we've got any more questions that have come up, I'll just stop sharing the slide. No. Uh, uh uh no worries so um you know just sally was saying great thanks and ali was saying uh really useful and helpful so many thanks for that so we are going to start wrapping up so it was an amazing amazing session i would like to thank caroline for you know de delivering this top-notch study session um again many thanks and hopefully we'll be having you on again soon I do want to thank everyone for joining and being a part of this Facebook Live. Please do remember that these sessions are recorded, so you will be able to re-watch them on Facebook, but also they're going to be up on YouTube fairly shortly. In fact, they'll probably be up on YouTube before they're on Facebook. So if you want to see it ASAP, I'd say check out our YouTube channel. The handle is that your AAT. So yeah, definitely check that out. For additional content, news and memes, of course, Follow our Facebook page if you're not already. Check us out on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. You know, we're on all the socials. The handle will be at your AAT. Of course, check us out on YouTube as well. But if that is all, um, yeah, I think that's everything. Many thanks for everyone for joining and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.